Our next speaker is uh, Professor Eli Wald. Uh, Professor Wald is at the uh, uh, Joseph uh, Sturm uh, uh, College of, of Law at the University of uh, Denver. Denver. He submitted a paper on the rise and transformation of the Jewish law firm. I understand he's also practiced in what I used to think was the Jewish law firm of Paul Weiss. So <laughs> he brings a combination of uh, practical experience and academic expertise, and his field is legal ethics. So we're particularly pleased that uh, Professor Wald can join us. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, of course, uh, thank the organizer, also, uh, organizers. I also like to thank the uh, David Berg Foundation, the Fordham Law School, and the Center for Jewish History of sponsoring my research. Professor Wald finds himself in a very peculiar situation. He's following uh, two of the most celebrated uh, Jewish attorneys in, the, in our jurisdiction, and he's standing before, uh, or coming to the podium before David Wilkins, his former teacher and mentor, and also before your lunch. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to summarize the first part of my paper in about two and a half minutes, and then turn to the second part of the paper, which I think is um, perhaps more um, interesting to this form, the title of the paper that you have, the draft paper that you have in front of you, is The Rise and Fall of the Jewish Law Firm. And in it, I try to explain and account for the remarkable success story of the Jewish law firm in New York between 1945 and 1980. Now, the statistics are in the paper, but let me give you just a few numbers so you can be on board with me, believing that it is indeed a remarkable story. In 1945, the largest law f Jewish law firm in New York City had less than 10 attorneys. Okay? By, 19, by the early 1960s, six of the largest Jewish, uh, lo large law firms in New York City were Jewish. And by the early 1980s, four of the largest 10. More than that, in fact, as a group, the Jewish law firms between 1945 and 1980 grew at a rate twice as fast as the old WASP firm. Indeed, a remarkable story. And what I'm going to do uh, with most of my time is provide, I'll uh, share with you eight unique factors that I've identified in my research that explain the growth of Jewish law firms. Now, there's an ample literature that talks about the rise of large law firms in general. So I'm going to spend maybe about a minute or so summarizing that. But again, I'm going to identify eight factors that explain not the generic general growth of large law firms, but rather the unique growth, the faster growth of large Jewish law firms in New York City. All right. So with that, let me tell you what's in part one that we're not going to talk about. Um, a lot of definitions, but specifically, I explore in part one of the paper what I call the hidden religious identity of the large law firm. And you've heard uh, Ken, so you might ask me what hidden, what was hidden about it. Uh, for practitioners in the early 1950s, it was anything but hidden, right? The religious identity of the large firm was obvious. And what I do in the paper is explain that at least the literature, first the economic literature of the the theory of the firm, and then the applied literature of the rise of the large law firm, in fact, does not identify religious identity as a constitutive factor. Right? So there are many factors that we are all familiar with. Right? The, uh, somewhat, I think Tanina before uh, already mentioned the cravat system. Right? So we, there's, M, there's this rich body of literature about the large law firm and the um, theory of the firm. It does not identify religion as an important constitutive factor. So in the paper, I attempt to distinguish, uh, draw a distinction between what I call the hidden yet robust religious identity of the WASP firm. And to be sure, the WASP firms were WASP not because the majority of their partners and their associates were, were Protestant. That was true, but that wasn't the majority. That wasn't it. The, as I argue in the paper, WASP firms actually featured a very rich white shoe culture, and also an ideology of professionalism that was at least um, a part of or product of Protestant values. Right? So it was both the identity of their lawyers and a culture and, a and an ideological commitment. Whereas, I, as I argue in the first part of the paper, the Jewish law firms that appear after 1945 did not develop 
a thick Jewish culture comparable to that of the WASP culture. That is, the Jewish law firms were Jewish mostly, but what I call discriminatory default. They were Jewish exactly because the majority of the partners and associates were Jewish. And they did not, okay. So that's, so there's, there's that in part one. There's also a lot about, and some of the uh, panels in the, uh, participants in the earlier panel talked about uh, the fact that one should be careful when one is um, engaged in a typological project. And of course, even within the WASP firms, there are many kinds of firms. So was the, there were some of the, uh, if you will, more bluish kind of uh, um, um, the, uh, the blue collar firms. There were the uh, firms that featured um, within the WASP uh, for a universe, firms, firms that feature uh, proud membership in the social registrar, so on and so forth. So I talk a lot about types and topology in part one. And now, um, having done injustice to myself in those two minutes, I want to talk about the unique growth of the Jewish law. Now, as I said, a lot of academic literature about the rise of the large law firm period. Mark Galanter is sitting here is in front, um, uh, has contributed mainly to about half the story. Uh, if you talk about the rise of the large law firm, I can, in, since I have just a few minutes, distinguish between demand side explanations and supply side explanations. And Mark Galanter and his famous uh, celebrated seminal tournament of, law, um, uh, tournament of Lawyers provides, if you will, part of the supply side explanation and talks about how organizational features of the firm acted as an internal growth engine. Um, so there's, and there's a lot out there in terms of the supply side of why it is that large law firms grew. There's also a lot out there in terms of the demand side. So I'll just throw at you and then refer you back to my paper that there were, the, the um, rise of the large law firms has a complex relationship with the rise of large corporate entities that demanded services that the old model of practice, mostly solo practitioners and, and small firms, could not satisf satisfy. So there is the rise of large corporate clients. There is the explosion, not just of corporate law and of administrative law, but of additional bodies of law. There is the risk, what Robert Nelson calls the restructuring of uh, the market for legal services. There is um, um, the very unique relationship between elite law schools and elite law firms that earlier panelists have referred to. All of that is, if you will, the uh, traditional scholarship. Um, and here's where my paper begins. 